day, may we be able to look back and know that we've been with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church family. I'm so happy to see all of you today. Um, first things, we're going to have some first readings of membership transfers to go over. Daniel, Daniel Stout is going to Silo Springs SDA Church. And transferring in, we have Jaden and Jennifer Elliott from the Sparks Church. Are they here today? I don't, didn't see them and Hugh and Judy Seagraves from Santa Cruz Church. And we're so happy to have Hugh preaching today and Judy's giving children's story. So if you haven't had the chance to meet them, we're super excited that they're becoming part of our church family. And I hope you say hi after church because they are fantastic people. And I'm super happy to have all of our uh, new members with us today. So we will vote on those next week. Um, there are a couple announcements in your bulletin. There's one for graduates. The graduate doesn't need to fill it out. If there's anyone that you know of that graduated from eighth grade, high school, college, graduate school, we just want to acknowledge them and send them a little card and stuff. So please put their name on there and what they graduated with. And when the offering plates come by, uh, you can drop that in there. So we really don't want to miss any of our graduates. So if you know of anyone, even if it's not your kid, whatever, like just put their name on there. If we get their name four times, that's okay. We'll still only send them one card. So we don't want to miss anyone. So any graduates, please fill that out. Father's Day weekend. Well, there's a little flyer about that. We are going to have a picnic out on the church lawn just right after service. It's mid-June, so hopefully it's not snowing. You never know in Reno. But if it's bad weather, we'll make plan B in the gym. But we're going to set up some tents for shade. We'll have drinks and cupcakes. Bring whatever your picnic is that your family wants or get together with some other families. And we'll maybe have some games out there to play with the dads. But just a social time. Come hang out with us for Father's Day weekend. It will be fun. If you were not here on Thursday night, you missed an absolutely amazing program. It was the end of our school year at our school at Riverview um, Christian Academy. And on top of graduating five eighth graders and handing out numerous awards and presidential awards, we baptized five new members into the Reno Church or the Riverview Church. And so I think that most of them are here today, and so I'm going to call them forward. Johanna Jukic, JP Jukic, Kian Lista, Alexa Dishashel, and Lynn Gallard. If you would come up. Church family, I can't tell you what a blessing our school is. What a mission opportunity. Like this is this is our mission. This is our heart. Five kids, and it, these are the most I'm going to start crying. These are the most wonderful baptisms because if you have not been to one of our school baptisms, it's not like a normal church baptism where we like some of us stand up and we clap and say amen. And I cry during those too. Don't get me wrong. I love them. But when we're baptizing kids from the church, a hundred children rush the baptistry because they want front row seats to see what Jesus has done for their classmates. They want to be able to touch them when they come out of the water. It's awesome super awesome so madeline is split oh no. so our thank you our newly minted and madeline has um flowers for you guys and so you guys have a big job after service today because not only do i want you to introduce yourself to the seagraves uh i want you to introduce yourself to our new riverview seventh Adventist church members thank you guys Thank you for coming up, too. They weren't sure they wanted to. <laughs> you can go on down, guys. And if I'm not already um, emotional enough, I'm the, not the right person for today's announcements. Um, as I was sitting in the audience on Thursday, watching all of our kids come up here and get awards and 
deliver their eighth grade speeches, which were some of the best eighth grade speeches I've ever heard, by the way. They were fantastic. Um, it really was striking home to me what a blessing our school is and our family-like community that we have up here, especially as we were you thinking of the aftermath of the school shooting in Texas. And just, oh, my heart just breaks for that community and those families. So um, we're going to take just a moment, and I'm going to read the 23rd Psalm, which I know you all know. So if you would like to say it with me, that would be amazing. If not, I'll just read it. But um, just as a time of reflection and prayer to hold those families especially up in our heart today. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So as we worship today, let us um, remember those families and keep them close in our hearts today. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, everyone. No, my name is not Khaleesi, but, you know, mothers has to always be standing there to take its place. Our offering today is the offering call today. Our offering goes to uh, Nevada, Utah Conference Advance. And I'm sure some of you might wonder where, where does that offering goes when it goes to the conference. That offering goes to evangelism, education endowment, and building projects. So um, as we wait upon some elders, I'm going to call elders. Um, B. Ray, please, can you come? Call it, Brian, please. We just need some elders, I mean some uh, deacons to come and collect. We need one more here, Bill. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Before you go out, let's pray. <clears throat> Our dear Heavenly Father, which art in heaven, we thank you so much for um, blessing us with life. Um, what a beautiful day it is out there. And as we collect our offering, um, we ask you that you please bless it, multiply it, um, to continue your work in this world and in our ministries for our church. Thank you again for blessing us. In your name I pray. Amen.
for the children's story. Come on down and sit up front. After you've dropped your money in, I'll be telling you one of my favorite stories. And I just want to say that although I have a ton of stories I've accumulated, I wanted to have one this morning that honored veterans. And this story is about, about a very brave soldier. And uh, I hope you like it. I even have some pictures. This story took place in Connecticut, in Yale Field, where some very young soldiers were practicing to go off to Europe to fight in World War I. And they had to get strong, so they ran and they jumped and they did all kinds of things. But a man by the name of Robert Conroy noticed over by the fence watching them was a little brown and white dog, something like the little dog we have, although I think it was a part Boston Terrier because it had white. Anyway, afterwards, the soldiers who were so tired of practicing, Robert and his friend went to make friends with this little stray dog. And they noticed that he was very friendly and they decided to bring him food and water and hope that he would come back again. And of course he did. And he came back and he came back and he came back. And they noticed something very special about this little dog. He knew what the bugle calls meant. They had a call, you know, bugle is like a little trumpet. And when they did a certain call, it meant to rush forward toward the enemy. And another call might make mean that they should stay back. And the dog was just so smart. Well, Robert became his best friend. And Robert decided that he would name the dog Stubby. And you know why? Because he had a little tiny short tail, just like our dog. Looks like it was chopped off, but it wasn't. Anyway, that's another reason I think it was a Boston Terrier. So Stubby became very special to all the soldiers out there on the field, but they had to go. They had to leave. They had to get on a train and get to a ship where they would go across the big Atlantic Ocean to France. Well, Stubby went with them on the train ride, but while he was on the train ride, the other soldiers said, what are you going to do when we get to France? or when we get to the ship, to go on the uh, ship to France, they'll never let him on because dogs can't be with little, little dogs can't be with soldiers in the war. So Robert had to think and he had a plan. In those days, they wore these big, heavy coats. They were multi-purpose. It kept them warm. It had big pockets so that 
they could keep their food there and different papers. And if it really was raining, it kept them dry too. Well, you can probably guess that Robert stuffed Stubby underneath this coat and nobody saw him as he climbed aboard the ship and he put Stubby in a coal bin to hide him for a while, but he didn't know what he was going to do after that. Well, somebody found him and happened to be another soldier who loved dogs and he let him out of the coal bin and he ran all around, Stubby, ran all around the ship and the soldiers just loved him and the sailors, but the commander saw him and he said, what's this dog doing on board ship? Well, Stubby took care of the answer because Robert didn't know what to say. Stubby sat up and saluted with his right paw up to his right eye because he had been watching all the soldiers do that. And he somehow knew that's what you were supposed to do to a man that was important like that. Well, anyway, by September, they were on their way to um, the west coast of France. And when they got there and got off the boat, then um, he was a little worried about what would happen with that, too. So uh, because the commander was so uh, happy about what Stubby did in saluting him, he said, any dog that can do that can be in my army. And World War II, World War I, they had a weapon called poisonous gas. And they had given all of the soldiers these gas masks that they could wear to protect them. And they even gave Stubby one. The only problem was it was built for human beings and it didn't fit well on Stubby's face. So when there was an attack by this poisonous gas, Stubby smelled it and got very, very sick from it. In fact, they took him by ambulance to a hospital. But you know, I have told you this verse, all things work together for good, Romans 8, 28. It was kind of a good outcome because one night the base was attacked by the enemy with this poisonous gas, only it was far away when Stubby smelled it and none of the soldiers had smelled it. And he ran from bed to bed to bed in all the different barracks and barked and barked and barked and barked. And if the soldiers didn't wake up, he would come to their feet and he'd nip at their feet until they got up. And at first they weren't very happy about that, but later they told him, Stubby, you saved our lives. And indeed he did. But that wasn't the first time in his um, um, life that that happened. You see, he had learned to tell the difference between the enemy, who was the, the German soldiers, who dressed in gray, their uniforms, and the American soldiers who wore khaki or camouflage. And one day, there was a German soldier hiding in the bushes, and he knew that it wasn't a friendly soldier. And he began to bark and bark and bark and growl. And the man spoke to him in German and said, nice doggy, nice doggy. But he was speaking in German. And so Stubby knew this was not a good thing. And he barked and barked until the man started yelling for help. And the soldiers and pulled, soldiers came and pulled Stubby off of him. What the man was doing was trying to make a map of the trenches that are dug in the ground, you know, like big ditches where the men would hide. And when they hid in there, they were safe from bombs, they were safe from <clears throat> other, other guns or whatever came by. And so this man was drawing a map of where they were because those trenches were like, um, what, what do you call it? Um, a maze, like a maze, and sometimes they ended and sometimes they went different places, but this man did not get to, to give away the plan. In fact, they ended up uh, put, taking him to prison. Another night, the, the, uh, Robert and his friend heard somebody yelling, help, help, and it was late at night. They couldn't see out in the dark 
where this person was or even if it was the enemy but all of a sudden stubby shot out of his trench and went and he was gone for a while and then they heard him barking very loudly so they followed the sound of the bark and it was a wounded soldier which they were able to bring back and another time they also heard somebody yelling help help and stubby ran out and the man was one of their soldiers and he wasn't hurt he had just lost his way in the dark and he was afraid to go out because there were landmines and scary things out in the dark there and stubby led him back he was quite the dog but unfortunately stubby was was wounded once by a grenade and he not only had to go to the hospital he had to stay in another hospital to be rehabilitated and some people weren't too happy that there was a dog in a human hospital but they began to watch him and he went to each bed wagging his little stump of a tail and they loved him so much one soldier said we're so glad he's here because it gives me hope that I will recover too well he saved hundreds of soldiers lives but the end of the story is a very happy one because after the war which by the way ended in November 11 1918 at Christmas time the president who was Woodrow Wilson came to their base and said where stubby I want to meet stubby because he'd heard all about him and so when the war was over stubby got to go home with Robert Conroy but Robert went to um, what was it oh uh, uh, Georgetown University to become a lawyer and he was allowed stubby was allowed to go with him and they made stubby the official mascot of Georgetown University and I told you I was going to tell you a story about a war hero soldier and that's what stubby was by the way you know what was important about that is usually war dogs are the ones that are German shepherds who are big and who spend long time training stubby was little and he was never trained he taught himself and that was a miracle but God sends us miracles and I have a picture for you and you can hand it out of the real stubby it's in black and white because it was taken so long ago and along with it is a Bible verse which we're going to say together today which says and you can say it after me so fear not can you say that so fear not for I am with you Isaiah 41 10 okay now you can show that picture to your family because they don't get to see it unless you show them yes sir I know I, I oh good good well I knew there was a movie with him but I didn't know if it was so old you hadn't seen it anyway thank you for being a great group bye Happy Sabbath, church. Um, man, you know, 
if I may please, we grew up actually in the church and I was reading over the mission statement. And um, I, I attend the Sparks Church, but my attention really was caught on to love God, love others and serve the community. But even more so, it's the go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So we grew up together singing. And I can't believe I'm going to say this, but it's been almost uh, over 25 years <laughs> ago that we've been singing together. Um, and last night, as we were just going through some of the selections um, for praise and worship this hour, we were really reflecting of the importance of Christian education. We were reflecting on the importance of finding spouses in the church, right? <laughs> and praise God, we all found spouses in the church because our youth nowadays, you know, there's other distractions that are causing them to be out there. And so um, we had a little group, it was called Deep Harmony. And, um, and you know, we just, when we were getting together to sing, we, I kept saying to myself, man, Lord, thank you for the gift and the talent that you've given us. Thank you for reminding us that our gifts and talents are to be used here, serving you. Yes, here in this space, but even more so, how are we using it outside to love God, to love others and serve our community? And so as we are going into our praise and worship hour, we selected some old school hymnal songs in hopes that um, it'll rejuvenate you. It'll re rejuvenate the love that you have for Christ. Because really how people come to church is not about what we, it's not about the doctrines or the, the 27, I think now 28 fundamental beliefs. It's how we behave, who we are. When people see the Christ in us, they're curious. They want to come. They want to sit in these pews. They want to know where you're getting that good energy from. So our prayer is, is that as we are going into our songs, that you are blessed, but most importantly, that God is honored and he's blessed too. Our first one is Blessed Assurance. Sing with us. If you want to stand, if your feet like, feel like praising, please stand to your feet. If your hands feel like praising, but if your eyes feel like praising, you can squint at us, smile at us. Let us know that you are singing with us today. Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance. Jesus, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Hair of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit. Washed in his blood. Sing with us. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture. is my story this is my song sing with us praising my savior all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my savior Um, 
when we all get to heaven, this has been always a favorite one. When, you know, it's, it, it's interesting because our experiences in life, as a kid, there are certain songs that touch your heart. This song, when I used to think about what it's gonna look like when we get to heaven, I just thought of like white fences and dogs, cats, whatever, you know, all that good stuff. And then say maybe some of my cousins, but as my relationship with Christ started to build, I started to see more. I started to see the pearly gates. I started to see everybody dressed in white robes. I saw happy faces. I saw smiley faces and I heard music. And so it's like whatever songs we go through, you know, whatever our walk in life is, these songs are always going to be there to keep us excited. This song is going to keep me excited because now I have children. <laughs> now that I have children, this is the goal. When we all get to heaven that we get to sing, sing of the wonders of Christ. So sing with us um, as we go through these first, these next two, two verses. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. One last time. When we all get to heaven. When we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. As we go into our last song, Worthy is the Lamb, through our experiences, through everything that we've ever been through, there's one thing that we always are sure of, is that no matter what, God gets all our praise. He is always worthy because no matter the good or the bad, He is always there for us. So I, I pray, look, I pray church family as we are getting ready to close off with this song that you sing this song with us with your full heart and you are declaring today that no matter what no matter the difficult challenges that we go through God will always be worthy he will always be seated on high worthy is the lamb can you all please stand thank you for the cross Lord Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now I know your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb seated on the throne. We crown you now. Victorious, 
take a moment to have all of our military, active and retired, and anyone who has ever served to please stand, and also all of our first responders. So if you would please stand, and we just want to say a special prayer of blessing over you today, if you would bow your heads. Father God, we ask that your spirit be surrounding all of our military families, not just here in this church, but in our whole country today as we spend Memorial Day remembering those who have given the ultimate sacrifice for their country and our first responders who put their lives in danger just like our military in the line of making our communities a safer place to live. And we ask that you be with them and their families as we remember them this weekend. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
As we, um, as our youth group is coming out to uh, sing, there's quite a few of them making their way. But I wanted to share with you guys that we have a, a Tongan youth group that's combined of some of the Sparks youth and also the Riverview youth. Uh, there's an annual camp meeting that we've been attending for the past 20, I think more than that, 20, 30 years. And um, we actually are getting ready to travel out in the next couple of weeks. So. We're seeking for prayers. If you guys can please keep our youth in prayer. Um, we're gonna be traveling to Seattle. So we're asking if you can please pray for us, our traveling there and just the program that's happening there because definitely um, we're looking to grow our communities. We're looking to grow our Polynesian community and really letting our, com our Polynesian community know who Christ is through our experiences as well. So as we are, this is one of the numbers actually that we're gonna be taking with us. So we pray that you all are blessed with this item.
Amen. That awesome? Boy, talk about taking me into the throne room of heaven. Thank you. Well, good morning, Riverview. You know, I want to thank you for welcoming Judy and I into your family. We, we have been members of the Santa Cruz Church since 1977. That's a long time. I know you look at me and go, hey, how can that even be? He's not even that old. But 1977. And let me, you need to know this, that we left a place that we were family. But from the first moment Judy and I walked through these doors and came here, everybody we met, we felt like we've known you our whole life. That is Jesus in you, you know that? That is Jesus in you. And I want to thank you. Because Judy and I, even though we're starting a new adventure here in the Reno area and at our new church, you are our family. So thank you so much. This morning our scripture is Ephesians 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 6. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love that he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, as we look around the world, man, especially this last week, we see the hatred that mankind can have for one another. The elementary school in Texas, the war in Ukraine, nations' cruelty towards one another, cruelty to, towards their people, humanity's cruelty to one another. And you know, the heart screams out, all we want is peace, can't we even get along? But the Bible says that there will be no peace here in these last days. The Bible, this book that I hold in my hand, 66 individual books are set between these leather covers, written by 40 different authors over 1,600 years. It's a God-breathed gift to you. It's a gift that God has given to you. And this Bible says in the book, Great Controversy, that fills in some spots, speaks of a time when peace and joy was of the uttermost. When the love of God was the essence, the very central theme of everything. And this was in heaven. In all of heaven and all the created worlds that God had made enjoyed this essence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Peace and harmony was paramount. The desire to be in the presence of God reigned supreme. But all people wanted peace. All the angels and God's created beings and all humanity that God created up to that point lived in this joyous state. They knew nothing else. The Bible goes on and says that Lucifer, being the highest ranking angel next to the Father, next to the Son, next to the Holy Spirit, he was the leader. He was the one looked up to by the angels, legions of angels. But something happened to Lucifer. He started feeling left out. Left out of the conversations between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit regarding creation and, and the rule of God's kingdom. And Lucifer started to feel something he had never felt before, and jealousy had crept in to his very being. And then over time it pervaded every every cell in his body and Lucifer began to obsess on the jealousy he had with one in the Godhead and that is Jesus Christ the jealousy that Lucifer had turned towards hatred for the Son of God 
Lucifer's desires started to change to a desire that he wanted to be like God. No, no, that's not good enough. I want to be higher than God. He wanted all creation to worship him. And Lucifer started politicking. Do you know what the definition of politicking is? It's you say any and do anything to persuade someone to your way of thinking. You can lie. You can have mistruths. It's okay. Do you know in the Congress of the United States, it is not against the rule to lie and have mistruths to get your point across. And the father of politicking is Lucifer. Lucifer. Lucifer finding an audience with the angels. Little by little started to persuade them that God was very unfair. That God held back this special knowledge from them. This knowledge that would allow them too to be like God. And to turn the worship that they would give to God to self-worship. That God was being unfair and he was holding this back. But Lucifer wanted to take a lead role in this. He, he wanted the angels and all creation to look up to him as the most high now. He felt that God's creation didn't have a choice. That God put a hedge around them. That God honored them and poured his mercy on them and they lived this good life. And he said, they need to have an opportunity to choose a God that is opposite of the God of heaven. And Lucifer wanted to be exalted as God. The book Great Controversy says that while this is going on, Lucifer is trying to persuade the angels that he should be the one that is worshipped. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit labor long and hard with Lucifer to get him to repent and to come back home. We don't know how long they labored. I'm sure it wasn't just a Sabbath afternoon. I'm sure it was a very long time because God never stops coming after us, does he? But Lucifer's pride forbade him to accept God's gift. He couldn't do it. To pardon him, to bring him back into God's family, into full relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Lucifer grew worse and worse as he became obsessed on how he had been wronged and how he had been treated. And Lucifer now was bent on full-out deception of the angels. Every angel he encountered, he pressed hard. Revelation 12 says that, that this encounter that Lucifer was having with the angels was coming to a head, and now the Bible says there was war in heaven. Not a war that you and I think about, but a war of words and ideals and of, of theme of how the world and how heaven should operate. Lucifer and a third of the angelic host were cast out of heaven with the whole universe and angelic host watching. And all of them had questions swirling in their minds on what is going on in the heavenly realm. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit knew that this evil must now be allowed to mature into full view of all of God's unfallen creation. Satan's rebellion was to be a lesson to the universe and down through the coming ages of what sin or separating from God does. When you unplug from the life giver, what happens? And worship yourself. And in doing so, you worship Satan. As the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit continued to create humans with the freedom to choose, 
the freedom to choose to love God, the father knew that Satan and his angels were out there to prove a point, that mankind could be persuaded to go the other way, to separate from the life giver, to unplug from the life giver, and not understanding that when you unplug from the life giver, everything will be destroyed. The Bible says that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit had designed a plan. Even the angels didn't know about it. That plan was designed before any creation even started. But this plan was a plan that God said, hey, listen, if I'm going to create beings in the image of God that have freedom of choice to love me, it could go the other way. And the problem, if it goes the other way, and they choose to leave God, humanity would need a do-over because they don't get it. They don't get it. They don't understand what happens when they separate from the life giver. We see in Genesis chapter 1, we see that God outlines the creation week of earth. The morning and the evenings were the first day, and each day God is creating, but he gets to his crowning act on the sixth day that he forms man out of the dust of the ground and breathes into him the breath of life from his own lips. And man becomes a living being created in the image of God. And God said, wow, this is very good. Life was very good with Adam and Eve. The Bible spells it out that they spent most of their waking moments with God. Do you know that? God is creating animals and bringing them to Adam and letting him name them. And he's coming up with such crazy names that he and God are laughing at what Adam is coming up with. And they're spending the day together. They have lunch together. And late into the evening, they're together. That was the way it was that Adam and Eve could spend all their time with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was all Adam and Eve knew was that relationship. But in chapter 3 of Genesis, we see this politicking of Satan where he uses a, lot, a little bit of truth and lots of lying and a lot of distortion and comes as an animal that Adam and Eve have never witnessed before or seen beauty like ever again. We hear about the serpent, we think of the serpents we may see around here, that's not what who he was. But at, as Satan, as Lucifer talked to Adam and Eve, he told them that God was holding something back from them that was very beautiful. That it would allow them to become like God and to be able to get everything they wanted, that the focus of their life would be them, and that in turn, behind the veil, they would be worshiping Satan. Then taking the fruit and eating it, it happened. Immediately, Adam and Eve, a great fear came over them and they fled and hid from God, hid from the God that they spent every waking minute with. Afraid to be around him, not wanting anything to do with God, actually having a disdain come up when well up within them for God. And life was changing so fast for them because now all of a sudden, instead of the lion and the lamb laying together and playing together, the lion was ripping the lamb to shreds and eating it. They couldn't go up to any animal without that animal running away or becoming fierce towards them. And the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit came together and they said, it's time to activate the plan. As the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit walked with mankind from creation to the fall, through the fall and over time, God wanted to educate his creation. Those that were created in him, his image, he wanted to educate as to the plan he had to save them. 
But you know what? It's very difficult to educate mankind when we're trying to run away from God all the time and we don't want him anywhere in our presence. Fast forward to when the Hebrews are enslaved in Egypt. They had been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. And God chose a man, Moses, to bring them out of Egypt and to this promised land. And God gave the Hebrews a celebration, pointing to a time of deliverance in their life called the Passover. Not only to be thankful for God's protection that night, but also to give them a forward glimpse into what God would do for them in the future. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, Cleanse out the old leaven that you may have a new lump as you really are unleavened for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the leaven, unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The Passover time is celebrated by our Jewish family April 15th to 23. It's right around when we celebrate the Easter celebration. The time that Good Friday that Jesus went to the cross and died. The time that Jesus rested in the tomb over the Sabbath sacred hours. And then early on the first day of the week was raised. But the Passover that is celebrated by the Jewish family, that lamb is all about Jesus. See, Exodus 12 takes place in Egypt. And it's the land of bondage that Moses is going to bring the Hebrews out. Egypt represents sin, darkness, and slavery. And Pharaoh represents this hard taskmaster that loves politicking, Satan, who enslaves the children of God. Do you know what the main god of Egypt was? Egypt had many gods. Do you know what their main god was? A serpent. A snake. The pharaoh wore a coiled serpent around his crown. The serpent was em engraved on their staffs and scepters. It was also on his throne in gold. You know, when I read this and was studying for this, it amazed me that, do you remember when Aaron and Moses first met the Pharaoh? That he came in with his staff, Aaron, and threw it down and it became a serpent. And then all the other wise men brought their staffs in and threw them down and they became Serpents. But Aaron's staff, who was a serpent, went and ate all the others. It's like God was saying, hey, listen, your gods are nothing. I am the true God. But through this Passover story, God is trying to give the Hebrews a glimpse into the future. That he is going to destroy the snake, the serpent. And what will God use to destroy the snake? A lamb. A lamb. I mean, a lamb is the weakest, gentlest of all animals. I mean, if you've ever watched a lamb out in the field, it looks like an overgrown bunny jumping around. They're not very fast. They're a target for any animal that wants to come after them. I mean. A lamb does not have fangs to defend itself with. A lamb doesn't have claws to protect itself with. A lamb doesn't bite you and fill you with poison like a snake. A lamb is totally defenseless. And so we see God is working to free his people in Egypt and out of bondage. Take a listen to this and listen how they describe what this lamb goes through. Exodus 12, 1 to 6 says, And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. 
and it shall be the month, it shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for the household. And if that household is too small for the lamb, he and his nearest neighbors shall take that lamb according to the number of persons, according to which each man can eat, you shall take and count the lamb. Your lamb will be without blemish, a male a year old. And you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel will kill their lambs at twilight. Other verses say in the afternoon. Take a look at this lamb. It's symbolic. It's a picture of Jesus. It's perfect. No spot, no blemish. A male of the first year. This prophecy was for the people about their Savior. Not just what was happening to them right then, but their Savior. The lamb was to be killed on a very specific time in the late afternoon. Just like Jesus went to the cross in the, and died in the late afternoon. This prophecy was pointing to the Lamb of God who would ultimately die for our sins. Hebrews 9.22 says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. You see, we are not saved by learning lessons in the Bible. We are not saved by repeating sayings that Jesus said. We are saved by receiving Jesus Christ into our life. And we die with him and he raises us to newness of life. The lamb we're talking about this morning was a very special lamb. It was to be slain at a very specific time. And then to catch the blood from the lamb in a bowl. Exodus 12, 7 says this. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two door, doorposts and on the lentil of the house in which they eat. It goes on in verse 22 and 23. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin. And touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of this house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the doorposts, the Lord will pass over that door and will not allow the destroying angel to enter the house. That's where the term Passover comes from. Passover. They had to have the blood of the lamb over their head. And the destroying angel passed over them. You see, the Hebrews could only be saved by the covering of the blood of the lamb. And it is the same today. It is Jesus who saves us by covering us, the Bible says, with his blood. And then he has stories in the Bible that says you must wear the wedding garment. You must be covered. In Exodus 12, 4, it says that this lamb was to be a shared lamb, meaning you don't keep it to yourself. You give it to others. It goes on in verse 8, and it says, And you shall eat the flesh that night, roasted in the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. You see, the lamb was to be cooked in open flame. If you read in the Bible how, when they ate meat, how they ate meat and cooked it, was always boiling it. But here, this lamb, this symbolic lamb, had to be in the fire. It had to be in the fire. This lamb, Jesus, our Savior, was the lamb who was immersed in the wrath of God's fire of everlasting separation from him. The bitter herbs speak of the repentance of and the brokenness of our lives when we eat the flesh of the lamb. John 6, 54 said, and Jesus ran into an issue with this. He said, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up in the last day. Wow, the gift of Jesus, his death for us, his resurrection covering us with his blood. But we can't stop there. 
We must eat the lamb. We must invite Jesus into our life. It's amazing how particular God is. We see the symbolism of the lamb and how the lamb's blood protected you, how the lamb had to die at a certain time in the afternoon. 1,400 years later from this Passover event, we find Jesus being arrested on Thursday evening. Jesus is being examined by the religious Pharisees and rulers and civic leaders in the temple, looking for flaws in every action he had, every word he spoke, everything he did, but they couldn't find anything wrong. He was the perfect lamb. Jesus is slapped and punched and bitten and beaten and humiliated, cut open and made to carry his cross to Mount Calvary, Golgotha's Hill. Do you know where Calvary was? 2,000 years before, Abraham was called by God to go to the Valley of Moriah to sacrifice his son. And God said, when you get to the Valley of Moriah, I will tell you exactly where I want you to go. And when Abraham got to the Valley of Moriah, God said, I want you to see those mountains up there, that, that one right there, that is Mount Moriah, that is where you're going to go and worship. And Abraham's son, Isaac, says, hey, Dad, I've, I've got the wood. You've got the fire. Where's the, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will provide. But this Mount Moriah, where Abraham went to sacrifice his son that God stopped him, is the same mountain that Jesus Christ was crucified on, Calvary. As we see Jesus on the cross, God himself did provide a sacrifice himself. We see Jesus dying for you and me, saving up to the last minute to save the thief on the cross. And Jesus bowed his head and said, it is finished. The lamb at that moment had slain the serpent for you and for me. Satan has no power over you. Satan has nothing over you. Jesus has you this morning. As Jesus was put to death Friday afternoon right on time, as he laid in, during the Sabbath hours in the tomb, and early Sunday morning as the ra early morning rays of sunlight peeked over the horizon, around Jesus' tomb, Satan and a myriad of angels had gathered around, standing room only. They were hooting and hollering and high five because the God of heaven was not going to be coming forth. But unbeknownst to them, in the heavenly realm, as God the Father stands up and he says, It is finished. And he turns to the angel on his right. And he says, go get my son. And the angel streaks out of the heavenly courtyard with speeds mankind has never seen through the darkness of space. He enters the earth atmosphere and breaks the sound barrier. That gets the attention of Satan and his angels. And as they look up, they see a fireball streaming towards them. And as the fireball starts to get close, Satan and his angels disappear. And that ball of fire hits the ground. And there's a great earthquake that shakes all of Israel. Here's what Matthew had to say about it. 
in Matthew 28, 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. Do you understand Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, said what was really odd about the stone, it was flicked about 100 feet away. Satan and his angels were gone. And Jesus, our Savior, comes forth. Jesus came forth from that tomb 2,000 years ago for you and me. Revelation 5, 1 to 14 says this. Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scrolls or to look into it. And I began to weep, John says, loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and to look on it. And then one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw the land, lamb standing as though it had been slain. With seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24-hour elders fell down before the lamb each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed the people for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard around the throne the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of, of myriads and thousands upon thousands, saying in one voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all of them saying, to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Oh, church family, Jesus has done it all for you and me. You're forgiven. Past, present, and future, you're forgiven, saved. God wants to give you a refreshed new life filled with joy. He wants to live with you daily, abiding with him. And know and trust when he says, you are going to have a future with me. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Just the way he originally planned. Jesus has paid it all for you and I. You and me. John 3, 16 and 17, a verse that we all know very well. For God so loved the world that he gave his begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That God did not send his son into the world to condemn or criticize it. But to save it through his son. To save it. Will you claim this gift that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gives you today and stand with me as we pray? Father in heaven, we get a glimpse of your awesomeness, but we don't understand. All we can do is say thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for wanting to come and make your home in us. 
and thank you for walking with us, with us daily and giving us a future with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us here at Riverview. We pray that you are blessed by the message that you heard. But we would be remiss if we did not extend an invitation for you for Bible studies or for baptism. If it is your desire today to receive Bible studies in preparation for baptism, or maybe you have already taken Bible studies and are prepared for baptism, we ask that you would contact us at the number below, 775-322-9642. Or you can visit us at our website at reno.adventistfaith.org. We look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, take care and God bless. Shabbat Shalom.